Yeah. You guys hear me? Yes. Woo! In the back, can you hear me? Great. All right, so we, uh, we're going to share mics. All right. Um, welcome. This is a Gargoyles 20th anniversary panel. stellar group of guests here joining us today um, who I will introduce um, and we should have more guests coming. Um, I've gotten calls from other members of our panel who are trying to find us. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully they will be here shortly. Uh, normally I go get them but um, I can't find them. Uh, but anyway, uh, my name is Greg Weissman. Uh, I'm the creator and <laughs> Um, with me here, uh, Frank Parr, uh, the other, my partner, the producer, director of the show. Uh, here is Tom Adcox, the voice of Lexington. And also Brentwood, Brentwood fans, anyone? Um, next to Tom is Pre Summer, the voice of Hyena. And also Susan Green. Any Susan Green? Yeah, no one remembers. Susan. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, Sally Richardson Whitfield. The voice of Elisa Mazza. Delilah. Few Delilah fans. And Sarah Brown, who was Susan Green's mother. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Carl Johnson, our composer. composer. Yeah. And again, we have uh, we have at least uh, one, two, uh, three more people coming. Um, who I know are uh, on their way. At least two of them are here, somewhere in this complex, looking for us. Uh, but because there are multiple conventions literally going on here simultaneously, it may take them a while to find us. But the good news is, is that we've got some time. Um, we are here to answer your questions because we have prepared absolutely nothing. Nothing <laughs> at all. Um, so uh, we are really here to take questions. So I'm um, looking for the brave first person right over there. All right. Series, movie, or comic book, or anything else in well, anything. It's life, so. Here we go. We got uh, hold on to that question. We we'll get to it. But we've got two more panelists coming up here. in a long time, some of these people. So um, let me introduce our uh, two additional <laughs> panelists. Um, right here we have Rishi Bako, the voice of Angela. Yeah. And Elisa Gabrielli, the voice of Obsidiana and uh, Maria Chaga. All right, and the question was, because my brain is like a sieve, just give me your question one more time. <laughs> Oh yeah, when are we getting more stuff? So, um, yeah. the, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, the easiest thing, obviously, just because it costs so much less to produce is a comic book. I've been working um, nonstop trying to get a new comic book series up and running. Um, I was hoping to be able to announce, and I can't. We don't actually have it, but, um, I will say talks are ongoing. Um, we uh, secured uh, Christopher Jones to do the artwork on it. Christopher did the uh, uh, Young Justice comic with me, for those of you who collected that. Um, so progress has been made, but I, we're, we don't actually have a deal yet. So um, as for the rest of it, um, uh, I have also not stopped for the last 20 years. It's really sad when you think about it. Um, trying to get us 
more uh, cartoon episodes or a live action movie or something along those lines. Um, and periodically Disney gets interested and then loses interest and those discussions are also ongoing. But obviously, you know, funding of multi-million dollar motion picture is a lot harder than funding a comic book. So, uh, but we are trying to do some things and I've been talking at a meeting on a live action movie uh, last week. Um, and again, nothing, I wish I could report progress, I can. Um, not because I'm being secretive, because there's been no progress, but uh, <laughs> um, that's what we're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith David, the boy from the lion. <laughs> it's a crowded stage, but they all came. Uh, you know, I I say to people, "Hey, want to do a gargoyles panel?" And nine times out of ten, they say yes. So uh, here is uh, this is everybody now, though. This is all you're getting. <laughs> all right. So. Um, Next question. Yeah, Carol. Uh, this is actually a follow-up to the previous question. Um, there's kind of been some stuff going on in the Gargoyles fandom about you know signing peti online petitions and stuff. So hey, let's take it from the horse's mouth. What can we as fans do to help you generate interest or generate uh, public interest or Disney interest? I mean, should we do a, a mass call-in? Should we do letters? <laughs> Oh. Sure. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I really, I, I swear to God, um, I used to think I knew and I don't know anymore. It's so confusing. Um, you know, there was that point where the Veronica Mars movie raised all that money on Kickstarter. Keep in mind, that was authorized by Warner Brothers. It's not like I could go and do a Kickstarter for Gargoyles. I don't own Gargoyles. Disney does. Um, and I, But it looked like that studios might for a while use Kickstarter and then there was actually this sort of backlash within the studios after the Veronica Mars thing where they were going, well wait a minute, we don't want the fans deciding what we're making, we want to decide what we're making and, and they, it actually, um, it was great, I'm a big Veronica Mars fan so it was great for Veronica <laughs> Mars but it, it wasn't too great for the rest of those properties that in essence are kind of being held hostage by uh, uh, these various studios, not just gargles, but you know, I'm sure you've all got, each of you probably has six or seven different properties that you'd love to see more of. Um, you know, polite letters are always nice. Actual letters work better than emails because the studios know that emails are really easy to just sort of knock off, but if you actually took the time to write a letter to the Walt Disney Studios, please make sure it's polite if it's rude. <laughs> Again, they're more likely just to throw it away um, just say, hey, really interested in this, would buy merchandise. They, what they really want to know is that there's money to be made. Um, you know, uh, it's a money-making operation, so think in those terms. You know, if any authorized product comes up, uh, Carol over here is wearing the Hot Topic shirt, so um, <laughs> authorized product that sells obviously does, gets more attention from the co company. Um, so it's that kind of thing. Yeah, Rod. Hey, Greg. Uh, speaking of live action movie, last April, on the first, somebody did a really mean joke. And some of us are still wiping egg off our face from spreading. Yeah, I get, uh, yeah, if you guys don't know, on April Fool's Day 2014, um, someone posted an article saying that Marvel was going to make a live-action Gargoyles oh, movie. Oh, so, so. <laughs> it's a really great idea. It was very exciting, but it came out on April 1st, which tells you what to think of it. The problem is is that, um, you know, I, I basically get tweeted on a nearly daily basis about this article, and what's made it worse is recently, some very well-meaning, enthusiastic fan took 
the head made a like a, a meme or something, took the headline from the article, but without the date. So now that's going around Tumblr, and people are now reading this and, and uh, thinking that it's just true, and there's not even the date there to sort of point to and say, guys, April 1st, see? Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, it, that's just not real. So um, I wish it was, but it's not. Um, yeah, way in the back. Good. Yeah. Okay, do you keep in mind it was 20 years ago? Uh, well, I have, I have the only reason I can kind of remember is that we did this, where were we? Um, uh, read music. We just did a, we did a panel oh, Denver. in Denver. And uh, I remember when I became, when I became a gargoyle and you were human. And, or no, you became something. Human, we, we, yeah, we were able to connect. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out for me. I don't know. Yeah, and that's actually my favorite too. It's called the mirror. She's talking about the mirror, and that and that's. Uh, I think I do remember one episode where a hyena, where all oh, the pack got upgraded. Right. Oh, sorry. I think I remember an episode where the pack got upgraded. I think yeah. we got uh, we got some new. It was called upgrade. Was it literally? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was one. I, got, I, I retain that one. Yeah, that was great because Hyena got these sort of... Killer claws. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. did that whole spider walk thing. Yeah. It was cool. Anyone else? I remember absolutely nothing. <laughs> Happy to be here. I think most of them were my favorite episodes. But I, there was, uh, uh, I could point one out, I guess. One was... The um, the gun episode, the gun went oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 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 off by accident, and, uh, and Elise was almost killed. And oh, so yeah. then I was in the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My heart went up. Oh. <laughs> that one was Deadly Force. It was written by Michael Reeves. Okay. Very good. You got it now. I've been living this thing for twenty. You guys walked away. I've been living this thing for twenty years. Yeah. Sure, it's a good thing. I'm just saying that's <laughs> um, Yeah, right here. Um, I just want to know this is a question for all the cast how your characters have followed you throughout the last three years if you have at all? Uh, I mean, they definitely have. I, you know, I, uh, the, the man that I love and the father of my children today for the first time found out I was hyena. On our way here, as a matter of fact, to drop me off. And he said, he said, Hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing a gargoyles panel. He said, yeah, why? I said, oh, because I played hyena. And he said, no way. That was one of my favorite cartoons. So the way it follows me is that way. <laughs> whenever, well, whenever, you know, whenever someone becomes privy to the fact that I was hyena, they, it immediately follows that it was one of their all-time favorites. So just a pleasure to be a part of something that's so endeared, you know? in the sci-fi world for a while doing uh, Eureka, so I've yeah. been in a lot of the, you know, and, and people didn't know, and they would get very surprised when you're there, and then the same, it's kind of aging me, though, because I'm doing another kind of sci-fi show that'll be out in the summer, and there's, the rest of the cast are all about, you know, early 20s, and they're like, oh, we grew up on Garth. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a double-handed Yeah, yeah, they're very I'm here today. I was little and I loved you. Yeah. <laughs> but we were all six years old when we did God so, you know, Really. Anyone else? My uh, uh, my wife right now, my first date with her yeah. was at a car close convention. <laughs> as I was dressed, I spilled gravy on my <laughs> Who paid for dinner? Well, you know. <laughs> it was me. Yeah. I paid for dinner. <laughs> 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 Anyone else? Yeah. 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 That's the old Jew in me just answered. <laughs> yeah, back here. This is a question for writers and or producers. Um, at any point did you realize 
uh, you are writing a children's show, so I should make it to four children, or do you write for adults, or who is your audience that you're writing for? Me. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we had a target, which was boys 6 to 11, that we were told in no uncertain terms we had to reach that target, which we did. And we made sure that we had plenty of eye candy, you know, big explosions, cyborgs, creatures, colorful monsters, stuff that a kid could watch and just enjoy on that level. But we tried very hard, Frank and myself and the writers, um, to create something that, first off, um, uh, didn't just work for little boys, but worked for girls as well. And we have, a, 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 as you can see here, a large female fandom as well as male. Um, that was very important to me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we wanted to reach tweens and teens and college students and adults and geeks like us, you know, so um, it was just about writing on layers and, and that's what we always tried to do with the show. Uh, and making, but that doesn't mean writing a show that kids can't watch. I mean, I think the show holds up very well and you can watch it, you know, those of you who watched it when you were kids can watch it with your kids now. There's nothing in there they can't see. You know, the toughest episode is the one Keith probably mentioned, which is where Elisa gets shot. But that one teaches an important lesson about gun safety. And so, you know, I, I think it's a great show to watch with kids. Um, but I'm biased. Don't listen to me. I have kids, and I'm watching Gargoyles, but them. So, proof for Good man. Um, you know, uh, up next, after this panel, is uh, the Dwayne McDuffie Diversity Award. Uh, is coming up right after this panel. And um, that's a subject that's sort of near and dear to my heart. And one of the things that I'm proudest about this show is, uh, you know, we had a very diverse uh, production staff, very diverse cast, and a very, you know, it, it, both cast in the sense of the actors playing the parts, but also the characters, you know, um, not just gargoyles, obviously, you know, we had gargoyles from South America and Japan and everything like that, but we also had, um, you know, made an effort not to have the, the show just be a bunch of white guys um, on the show. And, uh, and I think that's part of the reason the show sort of spoke to a lot of people is that um, uh, there were a lot of people who might have felt like outsiders and this was a show that was very inclusive. Uh, yeah, Yankee Sam. Uh, I just want to say thank you all for being here. Yeah. Uh, all my questions are directed towards the composer because still to this day, the music is, it's so iconic. Yeah. Where did you draw inspiration for that? What was the last part? Sorry. Uh, where Where'd you get uh, inspiration for it? Oh, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I, well, it kind of goes back to the question about how we were dealing with our target audience. And um, the, the writers of the, the, the scripts were never talking down to the people watching it. They were always talking to them as if they were adults. Um, and so musically, I was trying to do the same thing. I wasn't trying to do uh, what you would think of as cartoon music. I was scoring it as if it were a feature film. Um, and so uh, while I was working on it, I was thinking about the people I admired, the, the John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith, and the people who were doing really good work in feature films, and that's really what my inspiration was. It, it was, you know, how would John Williams score the scene? And uh, you know, do the best way that I could to try to interpret. Uh, and uh, you know, John Williams always had a big orchestra, and I, I, I didn't quite have those resources, but, uh, but still the idea is, is I was trying to relate to the kids musically just as if it were a, a, a big feature or, or any kind of epic musical story. So, um, Frank brought these pins, um, these gargoyles, these classic enamel gargoyles pins that I was supposed to be giving out to really good questions. So, uh, you get the first one.
And the kids are, I, I'm giving them out, which is weird because they're really from Frank, so you should be thanking them. Yeah. Um, you seem to bring a lot of talent with you from project to project. Like, you'll see a lot of the same great voice actors on Young Justice as well as Star Wars, like that. Do you, uh, do you pressure your casting directors to say, like, hey, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Be better. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm not on Rebels anymore, so um, I can't help you there. But, uh, uh, you know, I when I find great people to work with, I like to work with them over and over again. It's not always my choice. Uh, that is, I don't always get to have the final say. Um, and also, sometimes these people are busy doing other things. Um, uh, but, you know, they'll go off to Canada and write and produce their own shows or something like that. Um, uh, and uh, so I can't always get them back for that reason too, but um, I think Frank and I would both feel that whenever we can found someone who's really great, we just want to use them again and again. So um, that's good. Um, questions to me are less likely to get a pin because, <laughs> uh, yes. Why did I start Gargoyles in the first place? Um, okay, well, it begins... Yeah, that's for the pin. Come get your pin. Yeah, she can come up. Uh, well, Gargoyles don't wear shoes. Um, it really began with Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears. Um, Gummy Bears was a show created by Jim Magon, who's also at this convention today. Um, it was a terrific show, had a lot of great backstory and mythology to it. Uh, I had nothing to do with the creation of that show, but it, I just thought it was terrific. And it wasn't appreciated, and the main reason it wasn't appreciated, I think, was because it was confused with another show called Care Bears. Uh, and Care Bears was sort of this saccharine sweet show, which was just a bunch of colorful bears hugging each other all day long. Um, I was not that show. Did you? No, I don't know. I thought the show was in the movie. Okay. Well, um, anyway, Gummy Bears we thought it was great, didn't get respect, so we decided to do this comedy show, comedy adventure show, but instead of doing little colorful bears, we were gonna do little colorful gargoyles. And I'd always been fascinated with gargoyles, at least since uh, high school. Um, just the notion of them I always thought was sort of counterintuitive, which is this idea that you'd put some scary monster on the wall of your church or your castle to scare off other scary things. Um, and that seemed like such an odd idea. I, I sort of thought about extrapolating backwards, like why would anyone think that would work? Um, and then the answer we came up with was that, well, because once upon a time, these were actual creatures who protected the castle. And um, given that, you know, that they turned to stone during the day, the idea in later, you know, centuries or, or decades or whatever to actually carve stone statues and put those up so that people would think gargoyles were guarding their castle. That made some sense to me. So we did this whole comedy development. It was an adventure show, but it was comedy adventure like gummy bears. Um, and most of the characters were in it. There was a version of Elisa and a version of Lex. And, um, and we had all these... Uh, great ideas for it, and we went up to Michael Eisner to try to sell him the show at the time Michael Eisner ran the Walt Disney Company, and he didn't like it. Um, which I guess is a good thing, because we went back to the drawing board, and a guy named Tad Stones, who created Darkwing Duck, suggested uh, the sort of key piece that was missing. He's like, well, you've got all these funny little gargoyles, what if you had one big gargoyle who was more of a heroic figure, and he said, he said, you know, you've got this female cop 
what if you did a sort of Beauty and the Beast thing? Because, you know, Disney had this little movie even in those days called Beauty and the Beast. I don't know if you've heard of it. It did pretty well for the company. Um, and uh, that just really clicked for me. My background actually is in comics. And so the one character that really didn't exist in the old comedy development was Goliath. So we created Goliath and we took all the rest of the characters and sort of put them through the prism of a more serious show and came out the other end fundamentally with uh, the series you guys saw and we loved it. We created all these characters. We created the pack and, um, and all these great things that wound up in the show, the mutates and every, the clones and everything. And we pitched all this stuff to Michael Eisner and he didn't like it. Oh. Yeah. Um, and um, we realized, so we went back to the drawing board a third time, and we realized we didn't want to change the show. We loved the show. This was it. This was the show we wanted to make. So we had to change the pitch. So the pitch got focused down, and you can see the pitch. If you buy the season one DVD, you can see me at age uh, 40 introducing the pitch, which I did at age 30. I'm over 50 now, so it's like Dorian Gray in reverse. But, uh, uh, but you can see that pitch, the pitch that we sold it on, and you'll see that we just took all those extraneous elements out of the pitch, stuff that we still ultimately put in the show. Um, but we realized that they were distracting Michael from getting the main idea of the show, which was really the core relate, Beauty and the Beast relationship between Goliath and Elisa. And so that's what we focused the pitch on, and the third time he bought it. And from that point on, Michael was always a big supporter of the show, um, even protected us. Like there was a point where they were doing a walk around character for the parks of Goliath, and the guy uh, doing it wanted to put a big G on Goliath's <laughs> chest, like Superman's S. And I was like horrified, and Michael came in and, and the guy pitched that idea of doing the big G on his chest, and, and Michael looked at me and I'm like, mm, and he's like, no, we're not doing that. So, uh, and then the guy's like, well, can we put a big G on his belt? And I'm like, no, and so we didn't have to do any of that. So Michael was a big uh, supporter of the show, but it took us a while to get it through it. But, Thank God, because again, it, it would have been a very different show if we had. Didn't one of the toys actually eventually have the G there was, on the chest? There was a toy that like had a, the G on the chest. I think so. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't mind if the toys do anything that sells stuff. I'm good with because that will keep Disney interested. Uh, yeah, back there. Stuff from recording session to yeah. making a stand out. I think it was John Reese Davies. Uh -huh. um, was playing Macbeth, right? oh, yeah. and um, he came in, and and it was a line about he says. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, this one. Um, uh, uh, um, Goliath and he confront each other, and he, and he, he mentions Demona, and I say, "You know, Demona." He says, "No, I named her." <laughs> with that uh, scenario <laughs> all day long. That's where the pin, I mean, just got that story out of him, that's where the pin. Um, the whole, every, every episode, I remember just laughing so much with Sally, and we would get in trouble because we'd be laughing while, while everybody else was doing their lines. We'd have to get hushed a lot, and Keith always telling great jokes. 
And it was, every episode was just so fun. That was like the funnest job I've ever had. It was just so fun. Everybody was got along so well. And the guest stars were ridiculous. CCH Pounder and yeah. Tim what? Curry. Do you remember CCH I, Pounder? <laughs> yeah. Every time someone's walked up and when you were in the show. <laughs> Us, we were there a lot, and Ed Asner, Ed Asner, Bill Fogerbach, yeah. Jeff uh, Bennett. Yeah, but it was like Jeff, the, what we didn't see, you know, a lot of people all the John time. John Forsyth. Wow. Yeah. 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 Marina Circus. Yeah, yeah. 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 Frank. And John and yeah. Franks, we would see each other, but we kind of had our little core, and then we didn't see everyone. Yeah. I remember we all went to Disney World. <laughs> one year. <laughs> that was season one. You weren't on the show. We went to some Moroccan restaurant. I remember living in New York, and Bridget and I were roommates in New York, and you had to do us in New York at the time. Uh, I, was, I was roommates with Bridget in New York, and we would have to do ISDN from New York, and I remember running with her in New York trying to find like the top of this building like across a, a roof and into like this little recording studio and like always getting lost and trying to like get someplace on time and everything. It was it was really fun doing it even that way. <laughs> and we couldn't be here in LA. But it was always so fun working with everybody that we worked with us. I have to say, working for Greg, because he brings such beautiful story sensibilities and such an incredible sense of humanity. And I've had the pleasure of working with him to get the pin, pin on. <laughs> 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 no, I've had the pleasure of working with him on the Benny Project. Do <laughs> dance? I don't know. <laughs> Many projects, um, all of his projects distinctly have these incredible characters, these wonderful actors involved, these beautiful stories. and. They really hold up over time, and I think Gargoyles is such a classic because of his very special touch. Okay, again, I, I remember very little, and I never did drugs, so I don't know why. <laughs> but I, I think the most memorable day was the first day, because this was my first cartoon ever. I had never done one. And everybody was so groovy and so nice, and I would grunt, and then they would give me money. <laughs> but I came from the feature world where I was ranked and bludgeoned in almost everything I did. And I should make it on page four to six. And here I was, this young teenage warrior gargoyle. She was so strong and she was just an amazing, amazing classical figure. I loved her. Thank you. How about, uh, tell us about Jalapeno. Oh, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Well, this is kind of a long story. <laughs> we got time. You know, we got time. Originally, there's a, there's a, there's a woman named uh, Bernadine Mitchell, who's a phenomenal singer in Atlanta, Georgia. And we became really good friends one night. I went to see her sing. And she said, I know y'all came here to hear me sing, but I'm not going to sing for you. I'm going to sing for you. <laughs> and she said, since we're not in church, if the spirit moves you, I don't want you to say hallelujah, but I want you to say jalapeno. <laughs> and I, 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 I just fell out. And I, and, and, I just, and I fell in love with this woman because uh, throughout the evening, and I, I had just met her that night to hear her sing, and I swear to God, Every song she sang, she was talking to me. Oh. <laughs> That's how she, but everybody in the audience felt like that. She made everybody feel like that, but I, I know she was talking to me. <laughs> so, and you know, so throughout the night she would just say, jalapeno, jalapeno, somebody say jalapeno. <laughs> so I just, so now of course I have adopted that. And, and I, you know, it was, became a catchphrase for me. So I was, I, you know, we'd be in session, I'd say that, and, so our voice director, Jamie, Jamie Thomas. Jamie, Jamie bet Greg. He said, I bet you can't get jalapeno in there. <laughs> and sure enough, <laughs> he did. <laughs> so Frank and I almost went to war over jalapeno. <laughs> <laughs> um, Never make a bet against this guy. Yeah, the, the late, great uh, 
Gary Sperling wrote this episode called Protection where uh, Elisa goes undercover to work with, to try and bust Dominic Dracon, who was played by Richard Grieco. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and, uh, and Gary turns in this script and it's great because Gary's scripts always were, uh, and I did my pass on it and Gary comes into my office afterwards, he goes, so um, what's going on with all this jalapeno stuff you put into the script? Because I had to jump through all these hoops to get Goliath to say it. So I have first uh, Drake Hunt eating jalapeno peppers and then offering it to Elisa and then Elisa offers it to Broadway and then Broadway offers it to Goliath and at the end Goliath shouts jalapeno and Frank was like, you're insane. <laughs> but to Frank's credit, when we mix the show, you know, we, have, we end on Goliath shouting jalapeno. He's like, well, if you're going to do it, do it. So he, we put all this echo effect on it, so like the whole city hears Goliath say Halpin. And then Thomason says to me, okay, yeah, but you can't get Ed Asner to say that. So we then, and we began just to do, to pretty much one character after another, we began, Lisa said it at one point, Lexington, almost all the characters said it, and, uh, and then at some point, Frank told me that the storyboard artists were going to uh, foment a revolution if I didn't stop putting Alabama in <laughs> So what you see in the arc of the series is uh, um, you see, you know, it starts with that one episode with Goliath, and then you'll see a bunch of the characters say it sort of one at a time. And then for a while, we began using it like a curse word. You know, in other words, when they... When we couldn't curse, they would just say jalapeno instead. Um, and, and then what you'll see is that then it stops. And there's a bunch of episodes where you don't find it at all. Um, and then in the last episode that I worked on, which was actually uh, The Journey, which was um, the first episode of The Goliath Chronicles, which we don't talk about most of the time, um, I stuck it back in there because it was sort of my farewell, and so I, I threw it back in. But that's the, it all began with uh, the singer, yeah. uh, Black Cat. Yeah, that's not my favorite uh, thing with Argos was the mythology, so to everyone on the panel, what was your favorite mythology that you got into the episodes? Creep? <laughs> <laughs> you saw that blank look on there? You thought you'd encourage it? What, what does that blank look sound like? <laughs> <laughs> um, there were the, the mythology that was the, oh no, that wasn't, I was thinking of Puck and all that, but that was not. That was Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Where did that come from? Oh, that was amazing. Oh, well, I, I was out of my ass. <laughs> okay. Wow, we really nailed that. Nailed it. <laughs> What was one of your favorite mythologies? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, you first, and we'll try and get to everyone. We have some time, so we're good. Yeah. Um, I know it's been 30 years. It's only been 20. Uh, you're not getting a pin. Great job. 30 years. I can't count. Okay. It's been 20 years, but you've done over 30 episodes. That's what I said. 80. Over 60, yeah. yeah. I lost 78. I lost half of this. You just don't talk about 13 of them, I know. But <laughs> we're going to treasure those 65, whether they need anymore or not. But I'm not asking about a favorite episode, but you all know your characters, all the voice actors. What's the favorite, what's your most favorite thing about your character? Or each of When I grow up, I want to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I guess it was in relation to, to coming here, but I say that frequently. You know, I you know I, I turn uh, 
my children on to gargoyles because I, you know, I said I, when I grow up, I want to be like a lion. I mean, here's a guy that has values, family values. He's got moral values. He's got uh, community values. Uh, he cares about people. He, you know, makes and makes it a point about uh, not caring, not uh, being, but being diverse with it, with, with with his love of community. You know, it doesn't matter who they are. You know, you know, and, and we're not like. And, and, and I love that we're not like humans. We're gargoyles. We we protect everybody because they're we're we're a family. Uh, when uh, uh, when my daughter comes in, you know, we we have a family from all over the you know gargoyles from all over the world. I mean, I mean that's. I mean it it moves me. I mean that I mean his 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 uh, his humanity moves me. And 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 I, and I and I you know from the from the from from the audition when I when I came in, uh, my God, I love the way he talks. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's, it's, it's poetic and Shakespearean, but it, it just it just means something. <laughs> you know, it's not just it's not just. I mean, in, in fact, you know, it was good with, with this. This I did say last night. It was the first my first experience with. It. The distinction between what's a cartoon and an animated series. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think um, I felt I, I loved her honesty. I loved her acceptance of the gargoyles and her protection. She was brave. When I look at the role, I think this is the kind of role I've always wanted to do in, in a movie. Um, and been, <laughs> you know, and been. I mean, it's when I being here, I've gotten very excited remembering about all the um, episodes and how much fun and what a great character, probably one of the best characters I've had to play in my career. And I've done a few things and um, it's a great, it's a great memory. So it's, it's nice being here and kind of reliving it again. Well, I mean, let's face it, I, you know, Hyena was an asshole. But what did I like most about Hyena? I will say, ever since I was a kid, you know, when my mother used to hear me in another room, she said I, when I was laughing, I always sounded like I was over a cauldron. <laughs> I've never had a very delicate laugh or been a very delicate girl. And so I remember when you were casting Hyena, and she had to laugh. It was just my laugh. <laughs> so I guess that's what I love the most about her, is we both have that really wicked cackle. Yeah. We ain't no good. <laughs> I, um, I like uh, Lexington's uh, curiosity about things. And it was weird, because I'm still really a technophobe. I, I don't know anything about tech. Uh, <laughs> Technology. Uh, tech. <laughs> 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 really into computers. And really into, uh, and it seems like I, like I did uh, I did a movie Under Siege Two, which was a <laughs> fucking nightmare. <laughs> 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 it all. What a nice man. <laughs> 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 Been there, done that. <laughs> else's hands because I didn't even know how to do it. <laughs> I, I, Lexington's uh, just curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> love for, for uh, Hyena, but then they got in a fight. But Cree played my girlfriend in several things. And when I was Felix the Cat, Cree was my girlfriend in that. And yeah, um, well, the buzz of Maggie has a secret card. That's crush, right. But, secret but there's been several things for her. <laughs> yeah. I think our voices are like similar. Yeah, we both sound like a female version of Jack I, again, I just loved her strength. She was so strong. I mean, she, I, I don't think she had it together all the time, but she really tried. And she had the greatest father figure to look up to. I loved their relationship. She had a strange relationship with her mother, right? Do you remember? Yeah. I think? Huh? Yes. Yeah, we're good. good. Yeah. Um, I looked this up today. No, I really <laughs> <laughs> And But even the way they dealt 
dealt with that relationship with the mom. It was not, you know, black or white. It was really nuanced and interesting. But uh, she's the greatest father figure to look up to. So that was great. I just loved the strength of Obsidiana and what she stood for and uh, her death and how uh, she was. <laughs> and Maria Chavez was just sassy and badass, and that's always fun. So it was, uh, I, I liked playing both a lot. And I mostly like working with everybody. That was the real joy. Okay, yeah, right here. Do the second part first. <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> the first part is that I just really wanted to thank uh, you, Greg, for creating Eliza because as a mixed race individual, it was really hard to see. Like, like everyone else was like white on television when I was little, or they were very pale, and like I'm still pale, but I'm half Mexican <laughs> and half Japanese, so I didn't have to get, like a lot of people who were like me. And when I found out um, Eliza was Hispanic and African American, it was someone I would really look up to because she lived like kind of like mine. So uh, I'm just really Aww. thankful for that because it really helped me as a kid. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. named Elisa Chavez. When uh, when Sally auditioned for the part, she, it was called Elisa Chavez, but Sally uh, isn't Hispanic, um, but she uh, is part Native American, and so we actually um, altered the character to fit Sally, and so she became Elisa Maza, and uh, as was mentioned earlier, Nichelle Nichols played her mom, who was African American, and Michael Horse played uh, father, uh, who's Native American. Yeah, and so we uh, based that, and we even uh, <laughs> took Sally's headshot and sent it to Japan so that they could uh, see what she looked like. Uh, um, but again, you know, uh, that was always sort of a priority for me and my career is uh, just depicting, it's not, uh, is depicting the world that I see, as opposed to some version of it where, like I said, I mean, I'm a straight white male, but if that's the only kind of characters that are on TV, it's going to be a pretty boring show. I mean, and uh, so uh, to me, it's much more interesting, you know, look at the diversity in this room alone, you know, um, that's the world, that's the real world. So if I'm doing a show, I want it to be a show about the real world. It can have gargoyles and cyborgs and all sorts of stuff in it, but it still needs to reflect a real world, and that real world shouldn't just be straight, white, and male. For here, here. Yeah. Oh, but, you had a second part. What's your second part? I mean, gee whiz. <laughs> Do you have to fight for that? <laughs> I just love this man, and I'm, um, yeah, I think sometimes it's just some natural thing. You know, th th there was another thing, you know, it's like, the, for me as an actor, the best thing that, you, that, that can happen <coughs> is when I don't have to act. I don't have to pretend that I like him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to pretend that I'm attracted to him. Yes. I don't have to pretend. I mean, that's, I mean, that, I mean, I'm just, you know, you look in the room, you, you play the reality. But to me, one of my favorite moments in the entire show, which they may not remember, um, is after Elisa gets turned into a gargoyle, and uh, so he's seeing her through new eyes for the first time, and they're flying through the city, and uh, he says to her, "I never realized how attractive you were before." Um, <laughs> Because she was a human, and to, you know, and and she goes, wait a minute, you think you thought I was ugly before? And he goes, uh, whoa, updraft. And <laughs> I think he had a line that said, I'll hit that. <laughs> but there was a lot of double entendres between always you guys with the rock form. Always, and the always, heart. always make those. <laughs> 
remember after I turned to stone, yeah. come and pet my petrified fool. Yeah. <laughs> Just remember there are kids in the audience. But, uh, well, the fans came up with that idea. Uh, specifically, there was a woman named May Lee who, um, on the internet, there was this thing called the internet, and fans began to meet each other in these. Uh, you know, the kind of chat rooms that, and programs like that, I don't even know if those kind of things exist anymore, but um, in particular, there's one that does still exist called uh, Station 8, and you can find it at uh, www.s8, the letter S, the number 8, .org. And that's also where my website, Ask Greg, is, so if you've got questions about gargoyles, you can post them there. But a bunch of fans gathered on this Station A website, and they're like, we should do, you know, a fan thing, you know, some kind of gathering of the Gargoyles fans in New York, and we can go to all the sites, you know, we'll do it. And they did. They did a tour of Central Park and the Alice in Wonderland statue, and, uh, Belvedere Castle, and all these locations that we actually used in the show, because Frank actually went to New York and took all these photographs so that we, whenever we could, used real locations in New York, like the Cloisters or whatever. Um, so the fans all said, let's get together and do this. And, um, and then they invited me. And um, there was one where you got invited in Mr. Plane. I don't know if that was the first one. Uh, but they invited uh, Keith. And Keith was working on something, wasn't sure if he could make it, but then had this first date with the woman that eventually became his wife. Um, and I, uh, Keith and Dion and I went to dinner. Uh, why he had me come to dinner on this first date with this woman, I still don't understand. <laughs> but it all worked out, so, you know. Um, and, no, you know, um, and uh, Keith said, you know, I'm going to come. I'm going to come to the convention tonight. And I s said, great. You know, I'd been there all weekend, but he was coming that night. And, but I didn't tell the fans. When I went back to the convention, I didn't tell the fans. So I was doing this presentation. I knew he was coming. So partway through, uh, you know, a meeting like this in, in a hotel, I go, ladies and gentlemen, Keith David. But he wasn't here yet. <laughs> so they all turned and gasped and that, that kind of thing. And then when he wasn't there, they were so mad at me. <laughs> So mad at me. And so then later, he comes in the door with Dion, and um, I go, ladies and gentlemen, Keith David. They're like, oh, you're not fooling me twice. But then he comes up, and he goes, and he says, uh, right, all right. <laughs> I've been denied everything, even my ribbon. So... Um, they all melted. I think that impressed Dion. It didn't hurt anyway. So, um, so uh, uh, okay, we got time for more questions, but I only have one pin left. So let's uh, let's make it good. Uh, yeah, back there. Yeah. <laughs> well, for most of them, they auditioned and they got the part. Um, uh, Cree didn't audition, we just cast Cree as Hyena, yeah, and Elisa, um, we cast her as Obsidiana, um, but, and I was there from day one, so I'll let Frank and Carl... They gave me a call. <laughs> when, uh... They were coming up with the idea of gargoyles, the original version. We had heard about this this thing called gargoyles, and we had heard about the original version of it. Did you work back? I was I was I was working on a little show called Batman the Animated Series. Uh, 
far down the line, I guess they got the idea that, you know, since we're going to do this like an action adventure, maybe we should look and see what other people are doing. And I was one of the directors on Batman, so I received a call. And the rest, you know, I met with Greg, I met with uh, uh, Gary, I, I met, with, you know, all the Disney people. Uh, and it was a, a great and wonderful ride. So, uh, much like the actors here, uh, they gave me a call and it, it worked out pretty well. Um, Jamie Thomason was my first agent. I was in my commercial agent and talking with. Yeah, and Abrams were walking. Yeah. And I was in the office talking to um, my uh, commercial agent, my on camera, and he walked by and he, was, and he heard me speaking and he said, do you do voiceover? And I said, no, I don't. He goes, uh, well, I'd love to represent you. And I said, oh, okay. And they had a, a good voiceover department. And uh, so I uh, I think, and Jamie was my agent for about a year, and then he left and went to Disney. So I think, uh, oh, I did, did, Jamie, I ended up getting a movie called The Goof Troop. Yeah. And, I, and, and, I, and I went and did it the day, and it was one day of work. And uh, they kept saying, can you do it like uh, Polly Shore? And that was on Polly Shore. It was like really huge. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I really can't. Like, really like, yeah. So I did it, and then Jamie called me about a month later and said, like, bad news, they replaced you with Polly Shore. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you, make, you make all the money on those movies in residuals. So I was like, I just got here for that one day, I'm never going to get those residuals. <laughs> so, so then, uh, and so Jamie, I think, felt guilty about that, and he called me in for gargoyles. And, they got to hear me that way, and I think that's how. But actually, uh, Tom and um, Bill Fagerbachy were two of the first people we cast on the show, and they really solved the problem for us, because one of the big questions we have is, what do gargoyles sound like? Um, you know, And so what we realized is that Tom has this gravel in his voice, but it's, you know, it's relatively high-pitched. And Bill Fogerbach, he has this gravel to his voice, but it's way down here. And so, and then we just told Jeff Bennett to find the thing in the middle for Brooklyn. But, um, but, because uh, Jeff is a real technician, he can do anything really. So, um, so those three got cast pretty early on, but it took us forever to find uh, Keith and Sally. Um, it took us a really long time. And then um, Jamie came in one day and said, I think, I think we found Goliath, and he's like uh, Keith David, and I'm like, uh, and I was thinking of, there's this other actor named David Key, yeah. <laughs> and I was going, really? You know, I, I, like, I, I can't, I don't really see it. And, and then he said, no, 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 you're thinking David Keith, and I'm like, oh, who's Keith David? He's like, you know, they live, and I'm like, wait a minute. Is this the guy who had the 20 minute fight with Roddy Roddy Piper? I'm like, yes, let's get to him. He's great. <laughs> anyway, Carl, how did. Uh... Well, I, I kind of uh, did sort of the similar path. Uh, um, one of my, my first animated projects was Goof Troop. And. Uh, <laughs> 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 I was uh, working with a friend of mine, Mark Waters, who was the head composer on that show, and um, I, I was assisting him and the, uh, the VP of music for TV animation, a uh, lady named Bambi Moe, a uh, really nice lady, but we got to, to meet there on that show, uh, and I stayed in touch with her. I, I worked on, um, then subsequently, Marsupilami and, and Rob Tunage and, and these really interesting shows that Disney TV animation was coming up with. Um, but then also was working on Batman the Animated Series. And um, so I, I was kind of working on two halves of my brain. One half was sort of the action adventure stuff, and the other half was more cartoony. Um, so when Gargoyles came along, uh, Bambi remembered me from Goof Troop and also knew of my work on Batman. So uh, I you know, kind of had enough uh, connections with her and background with Batman that um, they gave me a shot. <laughs> I never, because you auditioned, you had actors come into it, not just voiceover actors, and I had never done anything like that before, and I, I was completely surprised I got that job. I was like, really? I got, you know, because I was going in, sometimes as actors you go in and you go, no, I'm not getting that, but, you know, they call me, I'm going to go in, so I don't know. Um... Yeah, well, 
I mean, a lot of our actors had either not done yeah. animation before or hadn't done much of it before. Oh. Keith, I think you had done like one thing once before. Um, like Ed Asner came in, like I had based the character of Hudson on Lou Graham, I mean, <laughs> literally. Um, which is, for those of you who are so many of you out there, <laughs> so much younger than me, you don't know who Lou Grant is, but you should. Um, but he was a character from the Mary Tyler Moore Show, and, and in the uh, pilot of the Mary Tyler Moore Show, there's this great scene where Mary meets Lou for the first time, and Mary, and Lou says to Mary, kid, you've got spunk. And she gets all smiling, he goes, I hate spunk. Um, and which is one of the classic moments in television from my point of view. So at the end of the little, uh, you know, when you audition, you write like a little pair, I mean, for the actors, you write a little paragraph that talks about the character. Um, and so at the end of the Hudson paragraph, I wrote, Hudson hates spunk. So Ed comes into audition. I never thought we could get Ed Asner. And Ed comes into audition. He, sees that little line and he's thinking, okay, this is sort of, but then he, was, he told me later, he was like, he was like he, his initial reaction was very positive. He's like, okay, this looks good for me because, and then he thought, but if I don't get it, I'm gonna be really mad. Uh, so he got it, of course, but then we were like, yeah, but can you do it with a Scottish accent? <laughs> so he did. Uh, anyway, that's where the pin. Because Sally, it, it was my second uh, voiceover job, and, and Keith's second, and Sally was first. And I remember just being so nervous you know, and, and wondering if we were doing it right and being so nervous. I remember Laura San Giacomo, it was her first job too. And I remember the, it was like one of the first episodes, and they had to, she had to growl. And you know, we didn't know how to scream or yell. I remember watching, going, How are we going to do this? How do you? Scratch or attack, or and I remember Laura Sandra Como going. They said you're a, you reach out, you're attacking. And I remember her going. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, Come on, make it bigger. Rajiv was like that. Rajiv came in season two. By which time, all of these guys were pros at doing all those grunts and growls and stuff like that. So Rajiv came in season two, and her first time, she's like. Eh. <laughs> But I tell you, by the end of the season, she was growling with the best of them. And the, the wonder, the, remember Street Pizza? We just laughed so hard about oh, that. Street Pizza. I remember <laughs> just saying that line a million times. Street Pizza. You mean Street Pizza. She, I didn't know that line. <laughs> uh, how long does this panel go? <laughs> We got till two, so we got time for more. I, I'm out of pins, but I got time for more questions. Yeah. I always like seeing the, the faces behind the voices. I just basically want to hear the actors like do the voices as characters live. Uh, do you guys have any like favorite lines that you could say from the show so we could hear? <laughs> Jalapeno. <laughs> that what we that what we what we, uh, we just did. Yeah. Uh, it was absolutely. You know, I remember. I remember uh, the. Drawings uh, of him on the, you know, because it's, it's after he loses his clan because he gets duped into going, you know, fighting this war over there. And then the war is really over here. And he comes back and most of his clan is dead. And I, I'm, again, I mean, Goliath moves me. That's what I mean. And, you know, I mean, and he's there. It's, it's, it, it's sort of, it, it, in, in a weird way, it reminds me of that moment. Uh, because I wept for a week when I saw this. Uh, uh, Dances with Wolves is my friend. I, it, it, you know, it, you know my, my name is Wind in His Hair, mm -hmm. and Dances with Wolves is my friend. I mean, I wept for a week when I saw it. I was, I was on my honeymoon. I, 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 I was bad. I'd be walking back to the theater. I was like, <laughs> but you know that again. That really moved me because I could, you know, he's he's on top of this mountain, and it was like, you, you know, in. Uh, 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 you know, the, uh, there's a Disney character, uh, I can't think of his name, but I played it too. Dr. The monster on Bald Mountain. 
and you know Chernobyl. 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 Chernobyl
Well, he was right. That wasn't really a question. So, <laughs> but it was good. I'm glad. Thank you. Uh, question? Way back. And who? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Can't hear you a little louder. When you were writing the show, like back then, of course, like every cartoon had kind of like a toy line attached to it. Were you ever any back then? <laughs> like forever, yeah. <laughs> were you ever under any pressure from the toy company to incorporate more elements from there into the show? Or were you oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's not hard to figure out. Uh, we did an episode where uh, the pack, Hyena and Jackal, her. Uh, Haina's brother Jackal, played by Matt Frewer. Um, another Canadian. Canadian, you're good too. And uh, they had this helicopter. Uh, you may remember this episode. They had this helicopter, and then the helicopter crashes, and Lex then rebuilds the helicopter. It just looks sort of gothic y. Um, and we did this. We, we jumped through hoops to get this gargoyles helicopter in the show because Kenner, which was our toy company, was insistent that we have this helicopter in the show. And we're like, they have wings. <laughs> um, and they're like, yeah, but can't you come up with the reason? So we decide, well, if they're flying really long distances, you know, they need some kind of... So then we did this helicopter in the show and then... It occurs to Kenner after the fact that, uh, wait for it, the gargoyles have wings. <laughs> now, they're not, they don't have a problem with it for the same reason we did. Their problem was is that the wings were so big. You know, on the show, the gargoyles could fold their sort of cape their wings down. Um, which was actually Gary, our boss, Gary Chrysler's idea, but it worked out great because otherwise, anytime you had three of them standing next to each other. You had to have this tremendous wide shot. Um, so we could do that on the show. They could get in the helicopter and fold their wings and they'd all fit in it. But with a plastic toy, you can't fold those wings. And, and the size of the helicopter that they'd have to make as a toy would have been so huge that the price point on it would have meant that no one could have afforded to buy it. So they never made that damn helicopter that they made us put in. So then they're like, put in a motorcycle. And I'm like, they've got wings. What is he going to do with a motorcycle? Put in a motorcycle and he'll ride on a motorcycle. So we put in the motorcycle, but you may notice, you know, and again, it's sort of a gothic motorcycle that Lexington builds for Brooklyn, but we blew it up in the same episode. Uh, which... I don't think endeared us to Kenner all that much. So. Uh, any more questions? We've got 15 minutes left. Uh, yeah? Um, I just hear for the last panel there talking about Frank Wilker. You all had Frank Wilker stories. I know Frank Wilker was you know, one of the main characters. Do you have any Frank Wilker stories? <laughs> Well, just that he's just, well, just uh, the only Frank Wilbur story I can think of is just that he's such a beautiful, gentle, kind man. Yeah. And, I mean, really, just like the, one of the tenderest people I've ever met. And uh, He flies his own plane. <laughs> Not only that, but just Frank, you know, I've been working with Frank since the first job I had with Frank. I was 12 years old. He played Dr. Claw, and I was Penny and Inspector Gadget. Yeah. Frank would not only do Dr. Claw, but he did Mad Cat, and then going on to do Tiny Tunes with Frank, and just so many great cartoons with him, and just always being so blown away by his repertoire. I mean, not just animals, but, you know, these incredible creatures that, you know, who could, who could imagine or create the sound of these fictitious creatures? And Frank always knows exactly what they're supposed to sound like. And that's a, an incredible gift. I have a good Frank story as well. Um, my first job in Los Angeles, my first voice job in Los Angeles, I booked a show called Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego. Yeah. 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 Didn't do that end well because 
Rita Moreno ended up doing it, and I probably looked it because she was too expensive for her. <laughs> I haven't been able to get her yet, but I didn't know that. So it's my first time. She was your Polly Shore. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah exactly. I'll get a t-shirt made. So I'm in the studio, and Frank Welker's there, and I'm, I'm reading the lines as I audition for them, and, and there's all these people in this glass booth, and they're all like, I can watch them, they're all talking and shaking their heads and nodding, and then they're like giving me direction, and I'm slowly like falling apart like on the, on the stage, and I can see everybody, and we have a break, and Frank came over to me, and he just, he was so lovely to me, and he just said, you are doing such a good job. Just let me tell you, I've been doing this a long time, and sometimes it has nothing to do with you. Aww. And he was so right and so lovely, and he like salvaged <laughs> my, my day at least. So <laughs> that was my Frank Lover story. And nobody does what he does. That's his real house, you know, is doing those creatures and those sounds, and no one can top him. He's untouchable. <laughs> He's the man. So mean. <laughs> <laughs> the growl. The growl was hard. Yeah. I, I think. Oh, go. Yeah. Um, the for for me one of the biggest challenges was um, I, I wanted to come up with some kind of sound at the very very beginning that was totally unique and and. Um, you know, it's kind of like alphabet. You know, there's only so many letters that you can use. There's only only so many sounds that are available. And um, we were in the recording studio uh, working on the main titles, and um, I wanted to find something for that very first shot. And uh, I had the percussionist who was there. And at that time, when when you hired a percussionist, they would come in with trunks and trunks full of stuff, toys, little things that make noise. And um, I had the guys start going through his tracks. We need to find some sound for that first shot. And he got out this big bass drum and hit it. And boom, I'm like, no, that's not the sound. And he said, wait a minute, I've got, I've got an idea. And so he reaches through his trunk, and he pulls out a box of dried rice. And he opens it up, and he dumps the whole box on the top of this bass drum, it's sitting flat. And then he gets his beard, and I go, oh. That's the sound. That's the coolest thing ever. And so that, that, that's what you hear on that very first shot, is a big bass drum with a whole box of dried rice. Oh. <laughs> drum that's cool. Wow. Yeah. For me, it was bringing personality to New York. Greg mentioned earlier that, that I had gone to New York and had taken a lot of, a lot of photos. Uh, I've worked on a lot of different shows where New York is kind of this series of set buildings and boxes and very little personality. It's you know basically background filming for the characters. And gargoyles, uh, to me, you know half the you know, half the effect of the show is is bringing the city to life. So that these characters had this vast playground in which to you know to, to do their thing. And overseas, where it's animated, we have a lot of this animated in Japan, they usually have a tendency to, to animate from what they know. And if you've ever been to overseas, <coughs> particularly in Asia, you notice that they have a lot of small buildings and a lot of small streets. And uh, that has a way of, of creeping into the cartoon show. In New York, it's just the opposite. You, you have uh, this, this vast, uh, networks of the streets and, and ponds and parks and buildings and each of them has their own unique story and the only way you can do that is almost by being there yourself well obviously people overseas aren't going to be there themselves uh, so I was there on on business and I decided to take a couple of days with uh, a couple of cameras and just walked up and down the avenues, visiting lots of different places. I built this, this big photo reference book for our overseas animators that were going to be used in Korea and in Japan. Uh, basically trying to, you know, and, and we had all these things for the writers and everything else, so we could use things like uh, 
you know, New York, you know, uh, Central Park and the cloisters and all these different things. We could actually stage events there. I think the mirror, we, you know, at Rockefeller Center, uh, there, there's just a lot of different things that, that added to the realism of these characters coming to life. Uh, the diversity of New York is something that to me is totally unique. And when we got those first those episodes starting to come back, you know, it was, it was really a very exciting thing to see how all this work came together, you know, from, from what the actors uh, were able to, to bring to their characters and bring them to life. And the fact, you know, as, as an art director, uh, as an animator, it's, it's, it's me creating a field for them to work their craft and to create something unique for the audience that uh, is unique. And with Gargoyle, it seems like we, we kind of did that because here we are 20 years later still talking about it. So that, that's kind of very fulfilling. Awesome. I think uh, there was one crisis moment for me, um, well, there are probably a lot, but one that sort of stands out is um, at the time, Disney was in a bit of a uh, so uh, there was a lot going on at the company, let's put it this way, and there was in particular Walt Disney Television Animation at the time, there was a lot going on on all the various shows, some of them were in crisis, and I had been an executive before moving over to produce, so um, it's sort of like being in an asylum, but you know how in asylums they choose patients who are a little better than the rest and they make them trustees, and because I had been an, an executive, they sort of left our show alone for a, a, a lot of the time, and I was sort of the lunatic most trusted um, <laughs> there. But then there was this moment when uh, our boss, Gary Kreisel, took Frank and I to lunch, and he's he was actually kind of apologetic. He was like, look, I, I have to admit, I haven't really been paying attention to what's been going on on the show. Um, Tell me what you're doing on the show, I want to hear. So we start telling him about you know, the plot developments and then we get to the part about um, Xanatos marrying Fox and having a baby. And he's like, oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, no, 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 you can't have the villain have a kid. You know, what, you know uh, he'd be such a bad, you know, that, that, that's just not right. You know, don't do that. So <laughs> there's this, Long silence as Frank and I look at each other, and then I just finally go, Well, we already did it. <laughs> I wasn't telling him something, you know. But but when I said that, the problem was is that we had done it. You know, we'd written the episodes, the stories had been boarded, we had sent them over for animation. They hadn't aired yet. So there's this moment, there's another long silence as my boss thinks about this. And Frank and I are sitting there going, we are so screwed. <laughs> He's going to tear up, because, you know, Gargoyles was somewhat, in, you may have noticed, a little bit intricately plotted. So, you know, if, if he decided against that, it would rip the whole second season up, basically. And um, so <laughs> you could tell that there was this moment where he thought about doing that, about ripping it all up, and then he just got this exhausted look on his face. <laughs> and so he said, he turns to, he sort of lifts his head, turns to us and says, well, just don't dwell on it. <laughs> and we're like, okay, we, we won't dwell on it. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> but there was that moment there where, like, we just thought the whole thing was going to come crashing down on us. Uh, we got five more minutes, so if we probably time for, yeah, back there. You mentioned that you did uh, Inspector Gadget. Uh, you guys are all great voice actors. Most of us don't recognize your faces. What are some other characters that you have done since Gargoyles? Also, yeah, and if you've got anything you want to promote, this is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Keith is on uh, Community now. Yeah. Yeah. Justice with Greg, and then I was yeah. Spectacular Spider-Man, I was on Mac 
Jack Steele for about a minute. <laughs> Rick wrote the part for me, because I'm half Mexican, half German. He wrote the part, this character is half Mexican, half German, blah, blah, blah. Wrote the whole part for me. I ended up getting the part. This is one of the ones I think he pushed and pushed and pushed for me. And we, I did it one day, and the cast was there, and I remember me and Ben Vereen, he sat next to me, and then I got a call that, the next day after we did it, and they said, oh, you're being replaced. You and Ben Vereen, I think we both were replaced. But, um, okay. yeah, the, the buzz on Maggie with Disney, right. with, uh, with Cree, and uh, a ton of commercials. <laughs> she could go on and on. She's the green M&M. <laughs> <laughs> you know you want some. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did, uh, yes, Penny from Respect to Gadget, Elmire from Tiny. Tunes, Valerie Gray from Danny Phantom, Max yes. from Batman Beyond, oh Princess Kita from Lost Woo! City of Atlantis, Boxy Love from Drawn Together, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate Colored Freaking Hair Performing, Nymphomaniac, Mistress, Salva Musician. <laughs> Susie, Miranda. Susie Carmichael from Miranda. Tiny Tunes and Miranda from As Told by Ginger. A lot, a lot, a lot of cartoons. <laughs> um, uh, what's, what's, what's my character? Big Man or something like that? Yeah. For, for, us, for a day. For a day. And the Young Justice. Um, um, I'm the Fire King in Adventure Time. Woo! Oh, yeah! Uh, Princess and the Frog. Princess and the Frog. Yeah. Uh, Spawn. Yeah. yeah! You know a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Voiceover stuff, but I, I have a new show on uh, this summer on ABC Family, which is their first kind of uh, jump into the sci-fi world. So, uh, and it's uh, I'm an agent again, <laughs> but I do for the NSA, and it's a secret government program where they stitch the consciousness of this young girl into the uh, dead bodies of people to find out how they got murdered so they can solve the crimes that way. What's it called? It's called Stitchers. And so don't hear the song. Basically, Allison Blake again. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've got a, um, a series of uh, CDs for kids that I, I worked on, uh, produced a few years ago. It's available on audible.com. Uh, if you look up Chris and Amy Adventures, and uh, the idea behind it is it's uh, gives kids uh, a chance to use their imaginations and visualize things based just on what they're hearing. Um, so that's kind of been keeping me busy for a while, and I'm bouncing around uh, doing a lot of orchestration at the moment. Um, there's a show called uh, Titanic Live, which is just opening up in uh, England right now, and it's the entire score from the Titanic movie performed by a live orchestra. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really cool show, and I was one of the, the team of people trying to reassemble the music uh, to match how it was actually edited to the film. So uh, check it out. Cool. Gargoyles. I did two other cartoons. I was Monique, the French bitch on Godzilla, you will be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did a cartoon, was that with you? Three by three eyes? What was that? Yeah. <laughs> then, because I was bludgeoned and raped in many movies, I decided to write a comedy for myself, so I wrote and starred in a show called The G-Spot, because I knew I would sell a show called The G-Spot, <laughs> which ran for four years. You can watch it on Hulu.com. There's nudity. No freeze framing, please. <laughs> and then uh, after that, I became a showrunner. I wrote for HBO, IFC, and now I'm doing a new show called Selfish, which is just about me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've done everything fast. I'm <laughs> Nana in Madagascar. I just played the moon goddess and Princess Kaguya. I was uh, in the Amazing Spider Man. Or I played Spectacular Spider Man. I played um, Professor Kafka. Um, I lots of voiceover stuff. Yeah, I, I, I do a lot of voiceover and it's lots of fun being able to play lots of crazy great characters. I'm under pressure. I'm giving back the mic. I don't work for 
for him on the new uh, book series that he's doing, which I can't talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Time. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, stick around for the Dwayne McDuffie Award. Side.